But I'm using my genius book. Right. Are you laughing at me? <laughs> Got to be a genius to do this, trust me. Right, so I'm, like I mentioned earlier, I'm going to be splitting it into categories. So my mandatory doc. Hi everyone, thanks for joining me today. Um, so today's vlog is literally to talk you through visas. So for the situation for me and Rika, um, Rika's on a spouse visa and that's because she's my civil partner. So what I wanted to do is actually talk you through, step by step, um, pretty much what I did to complete the process. Now we've got through obviously the entry visa, we've got through the um, extension visa. So the next stage, which will be around about September next year, will be the um, indefinite leave to remain. And I fingers crossed we can apply for citizenship. So we're probably mid, mid well, she's been here for four years. So we're almost there. It's obviously a stressful period as everyone who's ever gone through a visa knows. So the reason why I do it all, most of it all should I say, is purely on the grounds that originally I had to do that when Rika was in the Philippines. And also, most of the documents are mine to, pack, to sort the visa. So it makes sense that obviously I'm the one that will try and collate all of this together. So it's not that Rika has not done anything. She's absolutely been really good as far as reading up on policy, like the, the legal side, all the documents. Um, but as far as myself, it's I've collated it and then she kind of checks it and, and makes everything neat because I'm not always the tidiest person. So she writes it all nice and neat as far as labeling. But what I thought I would do is um, I'll talk you through the entry visa first. Um, this is the first visa for Rika to enter the UK. Now she came back in 2016, it was August, it was 2016. So there was a lot of preparation that I had to do beforehand. So this vlog I hope can be helpful for somebody who was in a similar situation for me, whether it's a you know a straight couple or as we are two women. So either or the process is the same um, because I don't know if you're aware, but um, yeah, gay marriage and civil partnership is accepted in the UK although it's not accepted in the Philippines. So I actually really wanted to move to the Philippines and that uh, is another story for another day. Um, but my plan was originally to move to the Philippines. But that kind of was not gonna happen whilst um, we wouldn't be recognized in the Philippines. So this is one of the main reasons for her coming to the UK to be with me instead. So what I'm going to do is we'll split it so that I'll talk you through the entry today. Um, I'll talk you through the extension and then we'll do another vlog and it'll probably lots of different vlogs to just explain where we're at in the process and fingers crossed um, this will be the last time that we'll have to apply for the visa. We've also applied for Schengen visas. We've done that on a few different occasions as well. So originally, when we first started the process, we had no idea and we were really, really naive. Um, not to go into too much depth, but the first visa we did, um, it was just for a tourist visa, uh, she got rejected. So that was our wake up call as far as, oh, the process isn't as easy as we actually thought it was gonna be. So because of that, um, that's when we decided to really read up on all the legal documents. So the government website 
has all the up-to-date um, policies as far as uh, immigration policies um, so I'd always suggest that being a good starting point to really understand any changes now I signed up for regular email updates for any changes um, I just so happens I get emails for just about everything now anything to do with any changes that's on the government website however it is really useful to keep on track of any changes with immigration it is always changing so obviously with the processes that we've followed before that is different now sometimes so anything I do say today yes it is as was but it will have changed or it could change so I would say make sure that you're read up and you understand or you can pay extra to get legal advice. I decided that I'm just, I can read all the documents and have access to it just the same. So I wanted to do that and, and understand it myself. And I often, I don't know if it's to do with the job or what, but I, I like to have that control. I like to think if it, if it fails, it's my fault. So, I wanted to make sure that we can, I can take ownership of it and make sure that we do everything as we wanted to do it. So I have this folder and what I do is throughout the whole time she's been here, I keep a track of any letters, anything that I think is, that's useful, that's useful. I file it away, keep them in their own little compartments just so when it comes down to actual visa time everything is there everything's in order and it's not the absolute nightmare that it can be if it if you're literally hunting for as many documents as you possibly can everywhere you can so that is a little tip from me just keep it filed away in a central place um, so that you've got access to that anytime you want so as far as the entry visa what happened um, as I said earlier that um, the original tourist visa got rejected so we realized that um, we needed a lot more information so after a lot of reading and I mean a lot of reading I spent hours and hours and hours just really trying to understand immigration law basically um, I read documents of what reasons you can be rejected, I read what documents you need, time skills, even to how it's presented to them. So I, I watched loads of YouTube videos um, and loads of Google searches to try and find out well what are other people doing. So originally for the entry visa, now each time we apply for visas the criteria is not that much different so for the entry visa um, the criteria at the time of when we applied um, I needed to be on a wage of at least £18,600 per year so at that time when we were considering applying um, I had a, we had a bit business going so I actually went to get some legal advice and they advised me to get a job so that's exactly what I did um, and I got a job but the wage fluctuated so although it was a good wage um, it, it as I say it was variable with it being variable that meant my wage fluctuated so with the with a wage that's fluctuating the where you meet the criteria of 18,600 uh, you do have to fa provide 12 months of um, proving your earnings so 12 months of pay slips or even if it's say six months with a variable it just needs to show that you've earned that amount of money within the 12 month period at the time of when we applied so I realised 
although we met the criteria, it was better for me to have a stable amount every month and then you just need to provide six months. So I, I did do that. I found a job where I could provide six months of a salary that was at the same amount. That made life a lot easier. So I provided six months worth of pay slips that had to be stamped by the employer. So I also matched that amount onto the bank statement. So it has to be the original bank statement. And if you only have internet banking, then you need to go to the bank and get them to stamp it. But in my case, I had statements delivered through the post. So that was ideal. So I'd say I matched them, payments, sorry, um, statements and pay slips and what we did was he highlighted where the payments were on the bank statements um, to match the pay slip and I put them together that way it's really easy for the home office to actually just spot what well, that's that wage you've hit that wage and they can quickly see those six months um, I also attached a p60 which shows your 12 months tax return and that also proves that you're earning over the 18,600 pounds that you need to. As well as that, um, I needed to get a letter from my employer to say that I'd been in the position for so long, what my job title was um, and what my wage was. So that was Take your box done as well. So from a financial perspective, so long as you can provide that information, it should be fine. Um, but as I say, everyone's financial situations are different. Now it has to go on the sponsor for the entry visa. It can't go on the actual applicant. So regardless of Rika working was irrelevant. It needed to be me. So as far as accommodation, at the time I was living in a city centre in a very small apartment which was too small for the both of us. So what I had to do was find a larger property which is where we are now and as you can see Rika, she's uh, here working from home. And. Um, the accommodation, I had to provide tenancy agreements, I had to get a letter from the landlord to say it's big enough, it, it meets all health and safety. And I also had to consider the cats as well. So I needed a property which was big enough for the cats. Um, the problem I had was time. I didn't have much time to arrange all of this. So it was kind of like the first house. It's like, yeah, that'll do. It's big enough, it meets all the criteria. So that will be fine. Turns out I hit lucky and we moved to one of a really nice place that has, um, well, you'll see it on loads of vlogs. Um, we'll take you out for lots of walks and things, but it's really a nice place to live. So that's the accommodation. And as far as proving the, um, that you actually live there. You need to provide um, bills, so that would be council tax. Um, as I mentioned earlier, your tenancy agreement. But it'd be things like your water bill, your gas and electricity, TV license, any government letters. So anything, to, any tax letters or anything like that is really useful. Um, maybe a doctor's letter. So it's got to be something official um, or like a utility bill. So I provided proof. Now I probably gave more than I needed to. So even though I needed to give six months of wage slips, I gave 12 months as I say, stamped by the employer. I tried to just maximize so that there was no possible argument for the to, to to dispute it. Then, um, obviously we've met the accommodation, met the financial, then there's the relationship. 
So we provided the civil partnership certificate, which we had to get legalized. So at the back of the certificate, there was a signature, there's a stamp, an official stamp, and we had that sent off and had to pay extra for that. Um, but that just proves that it's a genuine certificate. Um, we also had to print off loads of our conversations, online conversations with say Facebook, Viber, um, emails, letters, anything like that. We compiled as much as we possibly could. Loads of photos, um, proof of holidays. Um, we, now we'd been to Spain together, so she had, she had a Schengen visa. Um, so that was additional proof and keeping all the flights, all the tickets, all the reservations, anything that you can prove that you did things together. Um, and that goes to even me going to the Philippines on a few occasions, just proving that we'd met family. Um, and Rika had also been fortunate enough to meet some of my family before we applied as well. And that was abroad in Europe. So, relationship that is probably the bulkiest bit just really proving that you are together and that it's genuine and i also got some like references friends and family just to kind of prove that that they know or have met rika so as far as um i had to fill in a form to like a sponsorship form to um promise that I will support Rika for the next five years. When it comes to, um, as far as visas, as I say, the, the entry level, it's all down on my shoulders. As far as the um, extension and the indefinite leave to remain, that can be joint. It could even all be Rika. I could just put my feet up and chill, but um, I found it easier and more consistent to just focus on, on myself for the documents just because it's simpler and I'd already done it. So we've got the financial, the accommodation, the relationship, then there's the, you need to fill in the application form and the sponsorship form. I also had to write a letter, um, basically in this letter just explaining that how long we've been together, um, some particular dates such as civil partnership date, date we've been abroad, um, the date that I want her to join me in the UK and, um, and that I had to say that I will sponsor her and make sure that she's financially stay okay and that the, um, the house is above um, the basic standards that it meets health and safety is big enough for us I even said how many rooms and what rooms are, are in the house in this letter um, and basically I summarized all the bullet points that you have to meet to to, to meet the criteria So, from Rika's side, she had to get a tuberculosis test, so I, th I think out of everything that would have been the one thing I would have really disliked doing. So, luckily she only had to do it once um, and she also had to pass the English test. What was the test? Was it A1? A A1 test. So yeah, she had to do that. In the Philippines in Makati. In Makati? Yeah, that's where it was. I can't remember exactly where now, but it's close to, uh, it's close to Greenbelt. Was it? Yeah. And how did you find that test? It was alright. It was done like a classroom setting and uh, it made you read something in the front. They call you at the front and you read something and everyone's watching. It's really awkward actually. Was it? Yeah, it was. <laughs> and then they take you to a room, there's like two of you, and they take you into a room, and then you kind of need to have a conversation with the other person in the room. Right. And there's like an assessor in the front, and then you have to listen to recordings of 
some questions. It was all in, they all have British accents as well, the recordings. Amazing. <laughs> so, obviously, the, Rika had to pass those two things, which she also needed to go for the biometrics. So, basically, what I did is I collated all of that information and then I sent it over to Rika. I also had to get a printout of all of the pages in my passport and send that as well. Now Rika had to do the same with her passport and then as I say Rika is the organised one so she made it look pretty, she put it all together, she labelled it perfectly, um, she was the one that highlighted everything to point things out um, and then she had to go to the actual um, biometrics so she, she um, what I did is I I had to pay for the actual visa online um, and there was also a health national health service surcharge I had to pay for um, the whole process I would say with the biometrics that you have to pay for the visa the health surcharge um, it, it cost approximately £2,000 at that time, all of that. So that was all paid online, we booked, booked, did you book it, the actual? Um, I think we did it when we submitted the application. Yeah, so, so we, obviously it's a while ago now, but we requested it online, the, um, the date for Rika to have her biometrics. And then it was a waiting game, so I, I know that I think you paid a little bit extra, didn't you, for to find out the result? Yeah. To to have an update of what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. It's basically just like a text message sent to you. That it's received. If it's received where it is now, but then the only way we send you a message on the day the application's been received and then you don't get anything for the next mm -hmm. few months until waiting so don't know if it's worth paying for it. <laughs> Probably <laughs> not in hindsight <laughs> thinking about it now you didn't really learn that much. expensive to be fair but I don't know it didn't really do much do much yeah. so eventually how long did we have to wait, would you say? Was it a month? A month and a half, probably. A month and a half. Because I, I, I remember I made the application, uh, I think it was first week of June. And then I got the decision last week of July. Ah, uh, yeah. Last week of July. Now, Rika rang me up and she said, well, no, she I was didn't a bit. Tell you. Yeah, she didn't tell me all day, and then you just told me after I finished work. I think it was. You were at your mum's. Yeah. Oh, was it? Yeah. You were at your mum's. You were going to your mum's. So I didn't uh, speak to you. I know you were travelling to your mum's. Yeah, and then she finally told me, and that she'd got accepted, and they didn't grant it for the day we asked. So we were planning everything. For the yeah, for a particular day. I was supposed to. We were planning for me to come here in September. Yeah, September. So she actually came a, a month earlier. Yeah, but so. they basically just gave me thirty days to uh -huh. <laughs> to leave. Otherwise, you, you can ask for an extension, I think, but then you have to pay something like hundred pounds or something. Yeah, so we had a right panic. It was like, oh no, I need to get everything ready. I had uh, I lost a month of extra time that I thought I had. So we had to get um, plane tickets. Um, I had, we had to sort out the cats coming, um, which was additional stress as far as making sure that they were going to travel safely. And we had to pay to be collected and proper forms and we used a, a company in the Philippines and a company in the UK so all of that needed sorting as well but yeah you arrived in August 2016 wasn't it and uh, that is basically our story as far as the entry visa so if you 
want to know anything else about that, please um, just add in a comment and we'll try and answer anything that we can possibly can about this process. Um, but anyway, so I'm going to sign out now and we will do another vlog on the renewal book, the extension visa. And I'm also going to talk you through uh, another vlog of the process that we are currently in and getting ready for that one. Anyway, have fun and stay safe and we'll talk to you soon. So bye from me and bye from Rika. Don't bye. forget to like and subscribe. Bye.